Hi everyone, my name is Sergio, coming to you from Bilbao. I work at our programs in Nicaragua as, a, as an impact officer. This month, we are very excited to partner with all of you to provide bricks to build schools. Every 10 check-ins this month will provide a brick to help build the school. Bildung's mission is to break the cycle of poverty, illiteracy and low expectation through service and education. One of the ways we do that is by working with rural and economic, economically poor communities that historically have had little to no school infrastructure. We partner with these communities and we empower them to build good quality school infrastructure that provides access to quality education for their children. Bildung has built more than 2,004 schools in eight countries around the world, including Burkina Faso, Guatemala, Haiti, Mali, Malawi, Nepal, Nicaragua, and Senegal. In Nicaragua alone, Bildung has partnered with communities to build 271 schools. We are excited and grateful for your support and commitment to help fund another school with Bildung. This month, check-ins are going towards building a school in Nicaragua. So please remember to check in this month and help build a school that will provide access to quality education for thousands of children. Good morning, welcome to Columbia Grove. Pastor Paul here. Come on in, let's see what's going on. Hey, thanks for joining me inside the building. First thing you're gonna see is some of our Love Like Jesus swag. Feel free to grab some of it, take it with you. Show the Love Like Jesus message that we have here at Columbia Grove. Hey, some people got here early to make you some great, great, great coffee. Our hospitality team is getting the goodies out as we speak right now. Make sure you get something good to eat. Grab a cup of coffee. Feel free to stop by our greeting desk here, grab a name tag. Hey, we'd love to greet you by name. A little bit later in the service, we will be celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion. As you go to our communion stations around the worship center, you'll have two choices. You can use one of our prepackaged communion elements that we've been using the past few months, or communion wafer to dip into the cup. Please join us at the communion table. If you're needing prayer today, please stop by our prayer station. Hey, we're glad you're here. Make yourself at home. It's time to worship. Well, good morning, Columbia Grove. Glad to see you here. Let's uh, stand and let's sing. This song's kind of an oldie, but a goodie uh, in the sweet by and by. One, two. Oh, one, two, three, four.
Now this next song, this is the one, this is kind of a Columbia Grove classic. It's just based on the Apostles' Creed. We're singing our faith. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. It is all about Jesus. He is our hope. He is our peace. He is the one we worship today. Let's sing it together. We believe. 
So please have a seat. Let's open our service up with a word of prayer. Lord, we believe in, in God the Father and in His Son, Jesus Christ, and the work of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would have your way. Thank you that we're two or more gathered in your name. There you are with us. Lord, have your way in our midst today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if we haven't met yet, my name's Andrew. I have the privilege of being the senior pastor here at Columbia Grove, uh, just celebrating some really good things on this past week. You're going to hear a little bit more about this later in the service, but like we had a fantastic vacation, Bible school, some amazing volunteers. It's just good to see like children's ministry starting to happen again in some really great ways. <laughs> So it's, it's, a, it's a good time to be here, and here we are in the middle of a hot, you know, hot summer, and you're here, and we're worshiping together, and so we just pray that you would encounter God in what, with whatever God wants to say to you today. So uh, uh, I should point out we've got connection cards in the seat pockets in front of you. That's a great way to stay in touch if there's a way that we can be praying for you. If there's a song request that, uh, you know, a favorite, a favorite song of faith that you'd like the band to, if they can, you know, if we can, to play it. Um, just so we can be sharing in one another's faith and, and sharing in whatever God is doing in our lives. Let us know. And uh, there's, um, well, there's going to be some offering baskets that will be passed around a little bit later in the service. You can just put those cards in there. That's a good place for it. I want to invite Heather up. So she, she, if, if, if she appears a little bit tired, which she, she probably, she doesn't appear, I shouldn't say that. I've, I've been married long enough to know that that is never, ever, ever the right way to, to, Don't ask my age. I'm, no, no, with my apologies and <laughs> gratitude that you are here today. Don't hurt me. Um, Heather, would you lead our, lead us in a time of prayer for our kids? Of course, okay. of course. Oh, Father, we just thank you. We just thank Thank you so much for all of the children, all of the volunteers that came this last week. And what a blessing it was to watch and see the interaction between all of the different generations. And we're just so grateful to be able to have a portion of that legacy in our children currently here in Columbia Grove. And we just thank you for that. And <clears throat> Father, I pray over the children that were here this last week that you be with them as they go, as they're walking with their friends and their family, that you would bless their interactions and bring back to them the memories that they had here with us at Columbia Grove, that it would go with them continuously throughout their life. And we just thank you that we were able to learn and to love and to grow and to be able to share our story and know what it means that you love us unconditionally and we just thank you for the opportunity to be able to serve and all with that I just pray for the um, volunteers that are currently here to help support and continue to do that and give of their time and of their love and of their of their peace of their heart to share with the children father we just thank you and all God's people said amen Can you hear the passion in her voice? See, uh, this, so we are so grateful for Heather. So um, while our kids are getting settled in children's church, and this would be the time to, to head off to children's church kids, just take a few minutes and uh, greet a few people around you. Uh, let somebody know you're glad to see them. You can give them a fist bump. You can say, hey, Charlie. You can do whatever you need to do. And we'll put a few social media greetings up on the screen as folks are joining us from wherever they're joining us from. And uh, we'll... Uh, We'll just jump back into worship in about 30 seconds. So, get going. Jesus is our living hope. 
Let's join our hearts and voices together. Remember that in song. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the darkness, your loving kindness, tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my Lord. congregational prayer I just invite you even just under your breath just 
just to whisper that name, Jesus, 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 you're my hope. Jesus, you're my hope. Just whisper his name under your breath. Will you please join me in prayer? Oh, Father God, thank you for being our living hope. Thank you for your mercy, your grace, your loving kindness. May our hearts never lose the awe and wonder of what you did for us. We want to praise you. We, want, we love you, Lord. You are so worthy of all of our praise. Thank you for setting us free from sin, from death, and from every chain that bound us. You are holy. You are perfect. You are in control and we can trust in you. You can bring good out of any situation and we praise you for that. Lord, thank you that we can come to you with our frustrations, with our trials, with our cares and concerns. You hear our prayers and answer even when we do not see with our eyes what we expected. Help us to desire your will over our own expectations. Lord, we do not pray for an easier life. We do not pray for tasks equal to our power, but we pray for power equal to our tasks and that we would come to know you more and to see your strength and provision in our lives. Like Moses, we pray, show us your way that we may know you. Lord, we thank you for your beauty that we see in your creation. Lord, we especially thank you for summer and for the times of family, rest, and refreshment that this season often brings. We thank you that the fire season has started out slower, and we ask for your continued protection from devastating fires. We also ask that you would teach us your ways that we would know how to steward your creation and its resources. Lord, we lift up our local, state, and national governmental leaders. We pray that they would know you and your love. We pray for good decisions to be made in the best interest of all. We pray that we could be united as one nation under God. We ask for your provision for people on the margins of society, the refugee, the immigrant, the hungry, the persecuted, the defenseless, the poor, the unborn, and the elderly. Please give us eyes to see them like you do. Help us to know what you would want us to do and help us not to be overwhelmed and lose heart. No situation is too big for you and we want to be a part of your answer for it. We also lift up those who are in pockets of evil. Please give them avenues of escape. Please help them to come to know you and your healing. May they have peace and may they have hope again. May your love and light shine through the darkness. Please be with those who go into those pockets to help them. Please give them eyes to see and ears to hear. Please be their strength and shield. And we pray for those who instigate the evil, that they can turn from their sins and come to know you. We pray for the people of Ukraine. May they see your power, your strength, and your provision in their lives. May you guard the innocent lives and stop the invaders. We pray for peace and the end of war. May you guide the spiritual and political leaders. We pray for the New Life Radio in Odessa, Ukraine. May your shield of protection surround them. May your word go out and may there be divine appointments for people as they hear the radio broadcasts. May people hear the truth and have hope even in these difficult times. We also pray for the Covenant Church in Alaska and especially Shaktulik. May they continue to grow in you and see you working in their lives. We place before you the need that Chuktulik has for a new pastor, and we ask you to fill that need. Lord, we thank you for calling and equipping the missionaries, church leaders, and evangelists. We ask that you would refresh them and that your word would be manna for them. We ask that you would be their rock and their sturdy foundation. We pray for those who are hurting, lonely, sick, in struggling marriages, struggling against addiction, looking for work, and asking for your direction. Hear the cry of their heart. Help strengthen them in this time. And may you, they see you more clearly and know that you are near and that you love them. We pray specifically for all those affected by and recovering from COVID. May you bring them healing. We pray for Braden Ingrio as he recovers from knee surgery. Please restore the knee so he can use it without pain. 
We pray for John Buchanan as he recovers from a biking accident. Please mend his body. We pray for Vani Buchanan as she undergoes hip replacement surgery. May her new hip be a blessing. We pray for Lana Miller's friend Lane as he faces bone cancer. May he know that you are near and may you bring healing in his life. We pray for John Brandt and his family as they mourn the passing of John's sister Nancy. Please bring them comfort in this time. We also pray for Heather Davis, for her friend Mary, for healing in her leg. And now let us have a time of prayer where people can add their prayers either silently or out loud. We thank you for hearing our prayers, Lord. We thank you for our pastors. May you be with Pastor Andrew as he teaches today. May, may your spirit lead and guide him. And may he have joy in being in the center of your will. We ask for you to help us to hear you today and to fall more deeply in love with you. We thank you for the hope we have in you no matter the circumstances we are in. And please give us the strength to wait for you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Carla, thank you so much for leading in prayer. I just love, hear, don't you just love hearing her heart? Her heart. And um, I should also point out a couple of new members with the worship team. So uh, Brian back on the keyboards. It's kind of nice, huh? Very good. And his wife, Sarah. And so, and, and you, can, you can hang out there or you can hang out somewhere else, wherever, whatever makes more sense for you. But this is great, actually. So make sure to make them, give them a warm Columbia Grove welcome. Make them feel like a million bucks. We love it when people step forward to serve. And we have been blessed with just such a service-oriented congregation. We love, we love making the difference. We love using our gifts. So thanks for being part of that. Now, there have been times in my life where God felt very close and where his direction felt very tangible. I, I think of like uh, the summer that I turned 18 and actually meeting him in a pretty powerful way on the beach of a Bible camp. Uh, and, and it was that summer that some of the decisions, especially the decisions around, around music and college and things like that, where God changed my direction. He met me there. Think of the, the calling into, into youth ministry that happened a couple years later, or the, the call to head off to grad school that happened about seven years later. God was just clearly moving and clearly directing and, and, and you just felt it. I hope you've had times in your life where you just felt like God was close. But this is not a series about those kinds of times. Or maybe you've had times where it's, it may not be this really profound moment, but just a sort of abiding sense of God walking with you. It's just kind of everyday life, and you're, but you're doing life with Jesus. You may not be hearing anything big. It may not be fireworks, but you know, you're just kind of doing life with Jesus. And I hope that much of your life is lived like that, but this is not a series about that. And that's not the reason why we're going to be in the book of Habakkuk for the next four weeks. Now, there are times in life where, if we're being honest, and I, and I, hope, I hope this is a place where we can be honest, um, there are times where God seems silent, where God seems distant, where the world seems out of control and unjust. And you, we, we just find ourselves just wondering where he is, if he's forgotten us, and just what's going on. And we call out to the night. We do everything we know how to pray. We do all the stuff. We do all the stuff. And it just feels dead. The dark night of the soul. The experience of the desert. Maybe it's happened for you like it's happened for me. There were times of trauma in my life. 
times of loss or grief or just kind of world events. I remember exactly where I was in the morning of September 11th. And I imagine if you were older than about six or seven years old, that day you probably remember exactly where you were. And we've had plenty of other moments like that. And you just go, oh, how, 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 can, how, how can a good God be involved in this? That's why we need books like the book of Habakkuk. So, um, well, see if you can find it, okay? <laughs> so if you brought your paper Bibles, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, or if you, you, know, if you can find the book of Matthew, take a left. It's about, about four, verse, four books to the left. It's, just, it's short. It's, it's, it's just three chapters. Um, you, you can read it in maybe about 20 minutes or, or less, or you know, t- 10 if you went to grad school and you learned how to speed read. I mean, you, you can, it's not a big book. But it, it is, it's important. Now, in, in the summer times, I, I like doing series where we maybe venture through some, some books of the Bible that we wouldn't normally go through. And I've never preached through the book of Habakkuk before. Maybe, maybe you've never heard a sermon series in the book of Habakkuk before. But, but I, I hope you'll stick around. And I hope you'll dive in. Because it's a book that really helps us understand how to navigate faith when life doesn't make sense. And maybe this is a book you just don't need right now. I mean, maybe, maybe at the moment your life is just awesome. You know, you just won the lottery last night and you got home from your ski boat and you're off to your log cabin this afternoon and all your kids are happy and your grandkids are happy and you just, you're just wondering what to do with all the money and we're going to pass the offering plate so you have some options for that. But I mean, you're having just such a great day that you just don't need to worry about this. Um, and, and in which case, store it. <laughs> because that, that day is coming. And we don't like to talk about this in you know, in church settings, this is maybe, a, it's going to ruffle some feathers just a little bit because, you know, in the North American church, we, we really like to, you know, like to declare the victory. We like to be happy. We like to rejoice in the Lord always. And, 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 and we, we feel at times an, an awful big pressure and expectation to, to be positive. But books like the book of Habakkuk, help to biblically equip us with, with tools and insight to know what to do when life hits the fan, so, so to speak. You, you know where I'm... What to do when you or maybe someone you love, it feels like their faith is falling apart. Or, or to use some of the modern lingo that you've probably heard, your faith is deconstructing. And the answers you thought were, were you know, the, 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 the answers you learned in Bible, in, in Bible study or in Sunday school of, of the bumper sticker answers of how God works, they just don't work anymore. And you find yourself kind of staring into a big black hole in terms, like, from a faith perspective. This is where books like Habakkuk are so helpful. So it's not always going to be happy over these next four weeks, but I promise it will be good. And I promise it will be, it will be helpful. Because, see, we want to we build a faith that, um, that isn't, isn't just faith for sunny days, but faith for the rainy days as well. And if you're like me, and you look at, the, at you know, maybe even the last few years, and you go, there's a lot of life, that, and things that happened that I did not expect. I want you to build a faith that endures, a faith that endures hardship. Habakkuk is helpful for that. So let's just take a look at, we're going to, today we're just going to get to meet Habakkuk a little bit. We're going to get to hear his heart. We're going to take a look at the first four verses. So if you've got your paper Bibles or you can open up version, if you need to download version, jump onto our, uh, our guest Wi-Fi and just, you know, put something good on your phone, you know. Um, and we're going to get to know Habakkuk and then, then we're going to get to know a bit of his, 
uh, you know, a bit of what was going on historically in, in his world. Some of it's going to sound actually very familiar. And, and then see what even these opening verses can, can teach us about what it means to have a, a faith that endures in hard times. Okay, you with me? You with me? All right, we're people of the word. Let's open it up. Let's open it up. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, God, must I cry for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Yep, Habakkuk is having a bad day. <laughs> really bad day. Here's what was going on in his world. Now, we don't know a lot about Habakkuk. There's not a lot of, of, of additional material about it. But, the, but we do know that, I mean, it's, it's, it's center of, of the canon of Scripture. We find it quoted in the book of Acts. We, you know, we, um, so th this is, we can't write off the book at all. But here's as far as we know what was going on. So we're going to put up a little timeline on the screen here. So in about 722 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel was eliminated by the Assyrian Empire. If you're around for the Jonah series, remember, how, remember what we, the Assyrians, they were wicked people. That's why God, uh, when God sent Jonah to the Assyrians, it was pretty scandalous stuff. God, why would you want to even send a message of hope, even a message of repentance to people that awful? Well, well, they, the Assyrians, they, they heard the message, they repented for a short time, but a generation later they were back on the warpath. And the northern kingdom, because it was acting like all the other nations around it, after repeated warnings from God, the northern kingdom was annihilated by the Assyrians. And in, but in 609 BC, just like the prophet Nahum predicted, the Assyrian Empire fell. Also right at about the time of 609 BC, there was a good king, uh, Josiah. He had been reigning in Israel for about 31 years. Uh, he had brought about a bunch of, or I should say, reigning in Judah, the southern kingdom, for about 31 years. And he, I mean, there's a reason why people still today name their children Josiah. He, he was a really, really brave, good king. He brought people back to the word of God. He eliminated the Canaanite worship practices that were happening in the southern kingdom. He did, a, he did well. Josiah, Hezekiah, these were really good kings. And then he died. And um, immediately after... Um, Je Jehoaz uh, became king, and then in 609, Jehoiakim, who nobody names their kids after. <laughs> At least I hope you don't, please don't, if you have a, if you have a son or grandson, please don't, please don't name your son Jehoiakim, because his, his was not a good legacy. And Jehoiakim, went, um, I mean, when Jehoiakim came into power, the standards in the southern kingdom fell apart. And the people started to return to the ancient Canaanite practices. And as Hezekiah starts to write, it's maybe two or three years into Jehoiakim's reign. Now, here's where some of these things may start to feel very familiar. It is alarming sometimes, isn't it, how fast negative change can happen? How fast a crowd can turn into a mob, can turn into a riot. And, or maybe even, and this is the one part I may just touch on some political overtones. 
It's amazing how quickly a nation can abandon its own founding values. It can happen so stinking fast. And Hezekiah is watching this because he remembers. I hope one of the reasons why I hope you were paying attention in high school history class, and I hope that we, we remember history. I mean, watch the History Channel, whatever you need to do to remember where we came from, to remember what our forefathers went through, to remember what actually builds strong nations and strong families and strong individuals and strong people, because we're not the first people to live here, right? He remembered what the Assyrians did to the, to, the, to the northern kingdom. He remembered that the northern kingdom fell because of its own corruption. So, so um, um, Habakkuk is seeing all this. He's remembering all this and he's looking around at the southern kingdom of Judah and things are, they, they are emulating the same practices. And he, he's alarmed. Now, just a, a little spoiler alert. We'll look ahead and then, and then, and then come back. Is it shortly after, after Habakkuk prophesies, this is a spoiler for next week. It's the only spoiler I'm going to give you. Is that then the Babylonian Empire, surprise, surprise, out of nowhere, the, or in, in many translations, it's the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans, the Babylonians, would surprise, surprise, rise to power under Nebuchadnezzar. And then just a few years later, Babylon would conquer Judah. So Hezekiah finds himself see, seeing all this, see, seeing this rapid, rapid collapse of the nation around him as the, as the nation goes into and, and reverts to some of the Canaanite practices, the same Canaanite practices that were the downfall of the northern kingdom. Now, the Bible sometimes uses terms like idolatry, right? Idol Say that with me, idolatry. Now, when we hear about idolatry in the Bible, that might seem like a bit of a head scratcher. Like, so why is that such a bad thing? You know, so, so maybe there's like little statues, like, like, when you, like when you take your pastor out to lunch, hint, hint, at a really good Thai restaurant, hint, 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 and there's that cool little like baby Buddha, you know, up on the wall with the incense, and you're like, is, is, is that what we're talking about? No, and the answer is no. Now, I'm not saying that little baby Buddha is a good idea, uh, be, because the little statues, whatever they might be, um, you know, it's like the lucky rabbit's foot that you've got, or the, you know, or the, or the horseshoe. The, the, this is more superstition. And, and if you actually honestly put your faith in it, it is foolishness. It is folly. But that's not what the Bible is talking about when it talks about idolatry. I mean, it's sort of about that, but it's much, much more. See, in, in, in ancient Canaan, there were two dominant kind of... Um, God figures. You have Baal and you have Asherah. Baal was a god of prosperity and, and power. Asherah was a goddess of fertility. And when people were, were worshiping Baal, I mean, it was a pretty wild scene. The, the, I mean, the, the, the issue in Baal worship that, that caused... God so much concern beyond the fact that the Israelites were worshiping a false god and putting their faith in something that could not save them is in the very act of worshiping Baal. The high point of worship would be to sacrifice children to the statue. In case you're wondering, that's a really bad thing to do. And in, in Asherah, the goddess of fertility the temple practices would be extremely sexually excessive. I'm just looking around the room. Okay, I don't have too many, and only young children in the room. Okay, so there is Asherah poles. You, you read about these in the Bible. Asherah poles. Asherah poles were functionally phalluses. And, and so, you, so you can explain that to one another if you're not sure what that is. Um, now, 
And, and so what was happening in Asherah worship, around the Asherah poles, was pretty intense stuff. These are things that if you participate in worship in those ways, it will leave an indelible mark on your soul. And it's not just you engaging in a personal act of folly. This is way deeper than just showing up at Woodstock, you know? Though it's at least that. The, these are, are acts that as you participate in Canaanite worship, you cannot walk away from it unchanged. And the northern kingdom had been involved in this despite God's repeated, repeated admonitions to not. And Habakkuk is looking around the southern kingdom and as far as we can tell, this is, what is, this is what's starting to rise up again. The people are turning their backs on the one true God and they're turning their hearts toward the Baals and towards the Asherah and those worship practices. And it's corrupting to the soul. And so Habakkuk, he starts looking around. And it's no surprise, and we're going to read back through verses 1 through 4 again. It's no surprise that he calls out, How long, God, must I cry for help? But you do not listen. I cry out to you, Violence! But you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. Therefore, strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed. People, the people have heard what to do, but they are not doing it. And justice never prevails. The wicked him and the righteous, so the justice is perverted. And poor Habakkuk just feels like God has abandoned him. And perhaps by extension, it feels like God has abandoned the nation. Now maybe there's parts of Habakkuk's story that start to feel just a little bit familiar. How you can spend years and years and years and years trying to build something up that's positive and something that's good and makes a positive contribution and it just takes moments, seconds, days, one act, one person, one rotten egg, whatever it is to, to, to feel like all that's just starting to crash down around you. Oh God, was it even worth it? Where are you? Don't you see what's going on down here? Don't you care? You call out into the night, and just like my voice echoing in the room right now, that's all you hear. Your voice just calling out into the night. And Habakkuk feels distant from God. And that's the first thing we need to acknowledge together is that God's silence feels like distance. We call out to God, we hear nothing back. Those same warm, fuzzy feelings that you had when you're 13 years old at youth camp and you just felt the spirit call and it's not there anymore. Or that peace you felt in the hospital room as you're praying next to your mom. And, and, and yet, but this time, it's an even greater cr crisis and there's, there's nothing. That sense of strength you felt as you were facing the challenge in your 30s and God was there and you knew what to do and now it, it's not. And you feel very 
alone. The silence feels like distance. But that's also where the book of Habakkuk can be helpful to us. It shows us some, at least, of what to do. We're going to look at kind of two, two application points and two ways where our relationship with God is actually different than our relationship with the people around us. And it's helpful to know that. God invites us to have a personal relationship with him, but that doesn't mean that we always talk to God in exactly the same way that we relate to the people around us. So I, I hope this will be helpful. Because here's the first thing we hear and we experience in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk, he pours out his unedited prayers to God. I mean, he just lets her fly. And if we, if we take a look at the scriptures, now, now, does that feel strange to you? Is it okay to tell God off? Yeah, that was a rhetorical question, wasn't it? You're not sure how to answer. Is it okay to tell God off? Well, like, one thing I hope that we'll come out of this series with is that when, when I ask that question or somebody else asks ask you that question or your heart just asks you that question, is it okay to tell God off? The answer, my friends, let me see your eyes, is yes. In fact, the Bible gives us many examples of people of faith in hard situations who tell God off. Pour out your unedited prayers to God. Psalm 13, how long, Lord, will you forsake me forever? Psalm 24, a word, a psalm that was on the lips of our Savior Jesus as he was dying on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? People of faith pour out their unedited prayers to God. Now this is a way that maybe, let's just talk about this. This is a way where maybe our relationship with God is a little bit different than the relationship you might have with the loved ones around you. You see, the, one of the great things about God is that God is really big. And God doesn't get overwhelmed. God doesn't get emotionally flooded. Now, it is wise. Now, please, when the people around you offend you, anger you, disappoint you. A good relationship will have the capacity to talk about that. I hope you would. And as you talk to the people around you about your disappointments, your pain, your whatever it is, I, I hope you'll be thoughtful about how your words will land to the people around you because the th truth is they're going through stuff too. And they get easily overwhelmed, just like you. you know, so don't just let her fly on Facebook, okay? Don't just let it fly on Twitter. It will not end well for you. That will not cause the people that you want to, to reform in your life to, go, to see the light and, and draw closer to you. But that's not how it works in our relationship with God. At least it doesn't have to work that way. He doesn't get flooded. He's not overwhelmed. And the truth is, he already knows what you're thinking and feeling. So he, he's heard the words, even the naughty words, even the impolite words that your mom would mouth, wash your mouth out with soap with. He has heard them all. I promise you. And so it is okay. It is okay in those safe situations to really honestly let it fly. Because sometimes the only way to get through it is to first kind of get some of it out. And your heavenly father understands you enough that he can handle it. Now, your neighbor may not be able to handle it. Your spouse may not be able to handle it. But the God of the universe can handle it. So start there. In fact, as you start there, you'll probably get the, get the resources and strength to figure out how to better talk to the people around you. It's okay to vent, but vent in the right places. And I'm telling you, your Father in Heaven is the right place to vent. He can handle it. He can handle it. So let Him handle it. 
He's not waiting for you to get your life together, to get your words polite, to, to look, look your Sunday best, to have your church words ready to go. He's not waiting for you to do that in order to hear from you. He wants to meet you in the dark, in the pit, face down on the pavement. He wants to hear from you hungover. He wants to hear from you when you're full of shame. He wants to hear from you on the day that you wake up and you realize, how in the world could I have done that? He's right there. So pour it out to him. Give it to him. He can take it. That's good news. And the second thing that we see in Habakkuk is, is the foundation that enables him to pour out his unedited prayers to God. And that's that even it, when the world around him looks like it is filled with, with destruction and injustice and violence, the very reason that Habakkuk is pouring out his complaint to God is he knows that God has actually promised to work for our good. So that's the second thing we can remember. Let's remember his promises. Like the promises he gave the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 31. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you. Nor forsake you. Or the words that Jesus left with his disciples before he ascended up into heaven in Matthew chapter 28. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We can call on God to keep his promises. When, it, when the circumstances around us Don't line up. Call on God to keep his promises and remember his promises to you. Because God's silence, it does, it does feel like distance. It really does. Let's just be honest about that and be honest with God in our experiences of that. But just because God feels distant. That doesn't mean that he is. God does not ghost you. Now, I've learned this term over the last three years. You know, you know when you're, you're, you've been texting with, a, with somebody that you've had a relationship with, a friend, and, and, and maybe you've experienced this. I, I, I know sadly that I have. You know? And this has been a, a season where there's been all sorts of just cultural, all sorts of division and changes. I mean, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but, but who here has, has lost a friend because of a Facebook post? Well, so ghosting culturally is what happens when you're reaching out to someone that you thought you had a relationship with and they just don't respond at all, ever. It's like you're a ghost. Friends, God does not ghost you. And when, when you're calling out in the midst of the night, that doesn't mean that he's left. It doesn't mean he's abandoned you, and it doesn't mean he doesn't want to hear from you anymore. Now, it might mean that he's... well, And, and this is one more spoiler alert before next week. It, it might mean that he's doing something behind the scenes that at the moment you can't fully understand. And it might mean that he's actually looking to develop something in you through the silence that can only be built by the silence. Remember when our, 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 our girls are, um, well now they're, they're, they're virtually grown. <laughs> our, our youngest is 18. She's, at, she's at, at camp. She'll be home next week. Next week. Okay. Okay, although we're, we're gonna, we're, I'm on vacation next week, but the week after that we're back and we've got a cello player again. It's going to be awesome. Okay, now, when they were younger, when they were younger, okay, um, 
Do you, do you, who here remembers when you, when you had like a one-year-old and a, or a two-year-old and you're trying to put them to bed at night? Okay, let's see some show of hands. Right. And, and so I, I remember having Lauren and I would, and uh, we, there's, there were, there's tricks, there's daddy tricks, you know, yeah. and I remember, and her head would be right here, and her body would be just, she'd be, it was like a football carry, and I would just rock her, or, or if she was face up, I would, I would do this trick, um, I, I, I would, I would, I would run my finger along the bridge of her nose, just try doing that for a second. You know how it makes you want to close your eyes? Because I knew if I could get her eyes to close for about three seconds at the time, she'd be out. Okay. So I would do that. She's still in her 20s. If you go and you do that, she's like, okay. Don't tell her I told you that. I'll get in big trouble. Now, although Jacob, that's her husband. If you're watching, go for it. Okay. And so, but just, the, the, well, I, we've got daddy tricks, these things that you do, and you, and you put her, you, your child finally falls to sleep. And maybe you remember doing this. And, and then you carry, you carry your daughter. You know, this, this person you would literally do anything for. And, and you place her in the, in the crib. And then you, 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 you walk away. Because, yeah, this, this is a volatile situation here. You, she doesn't realize how, how beautiful sleep is. And sometimes... And sometimes, maybe you've gone through this, and sometimes she would stir, and she would start to cry. And there were times, now, now you, 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 you learn to listen to different kinds of cries, but there's some forms of crying, you, you, like for her own good, you want to give her a chance to, to, to soothe herself and to settle herself down. And she's crying out. For her daddy or at that point more likely mommy truthfully mommy's the rock star daddy's daddy's just the accomplice but you know but the she is crying out and she's in the dark and her parent is not responding and what she doesn't know is that you are just you're pressed on the other side of the of the nursery door and you are listening to everything, and it's killing you. Because there's a big part of you that just wants to run in there and pick her up. But you know, at this moment, the only way that she's going to be able to grow and be able to handle some of the hardships in life is at least with this. Now, you'd come in for a crisis, that's the truth. But at least for this moment, you've got to let her cry it out. He's still there. Your heavenly Father is still there. It may be dark. It may be silent. But he's still there. Maybe you're going through a moment like that this morning. If so, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. And I hope this can be a safe place where we can start to process sadness and pain together. A healthy church is not always a place where you... Ha I mean, it'll be a happy place to be. It'll be a welcoming and safe place to be. That, but that doesn't mean that every story we share with one another needs to be a victory story. This is a safe place, and I want it to be a safe place where we can be real about pain, about sadness, and about the times when the bumper sticker answers that we've been raised with start to fall apart. Doubt is an essential part of faith. I'd like you to try a little prayer exercise with me. 
This, this one is, is one that you'll, you'll it, it's, a, it's, it's a buddy system, okay? So if you're sitting next to somebody, I'd like you to, to do this, or, or if, if you can, if it's a group of three, make a group of three. If you're joining me, us online, maybe you're, it's, if you're sitting next to somebody, do this together. If it's, if it's just you solo, well, it's just, just you and me, okay? Um, actually, could, could we bring the camera in just a little bit closer? I'm going to need, need a, a, little bit, a little bit more of a close-up in order to, to do some of this. So as you're sitting next to somebody, if it's appropriate, if it's appropriate, um, either put your hand on their shoulder, or you know, if, you, you know, if you're married to them, you can just go ahead and grab hands. But hand on their shoulder, grab hands if it's appropriate, if it's appropriate, okay? And I want one of you to say to the other one of you, I'd like you to, to, to say, as you're, as you're holding hands or you've got a hand on the shoulder, speak this to the person next to you. I'm still here. Now, you believe that, right? That's right. Now, you get to decide between the two of you, one of you is gonna, needs to close your eyes. So you, 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 you decide, or, or of, the, of the threesome that you've got, I need one of you or, or two of you to close your eyes, okay? So, so pick, you can pick. You can rock, paper, scissors, go, okay? Figure it out. Some, somebody is going to close their eyes. Somebody got their eyes closed in the, in, the, in the duo? Okay. Now, with the other person, I'd like, if you had your hand on their shoulder or your, your holding hands, I'd like you to remove your hand. Take your hand off them. And say it, say it one more time. I'm still here. And you believe that, don't you? Okay. Now, with, with one person with their eyes closed and the other person, okay? I want you to do this one more time, but I'd like you to do it this way. So watch, watch me closely. To your partner, say this. One more time. And now I'd like you, if you had your eyes closed, I'd like you to open your eyes. Do you know what? They're still here. Right? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you that you're with us not only in the, the days that are sunny <laughs> and moments that, that feel clear and victorious, but you're also there on, on the days that feel dark, where our hearts are heavy, where the world is falling apart. And God, we recognize that our, our life with you is not always going to feel good. It's not always going to be clear. It's not always going to be up and to the right. It's not always going to feel like one victory after the other. We recognize that a sincere life of faith will at times feel like darkness, like sadness, and like defeat. Thank you, God, that in those moments, we can still come to you. And friends, even as, as, we're, as we're praying, Maybe this is just something you do under your breath for a moment, but if you need to say something to God, even if you don't feel him today, I mean, you're just here by sheer willpower or peer pressure or, or habit or whatever. If there's something you need to say to him, 
Say it. Give it to him. He can take it. So Lord, help us to trust you in the silence, in the dark, in the sadness, in the discouragement. God, thank you that whether I feel you in this moment or not, you're still here. You're still here. Thank you, God, that you love me enough that even in my darkest hour, even in my heart's rebellion, even in my sin nature that turns its back on you, that you did not abandon me. In fact, you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me, for us, for all who will receive it. And whether I see it or feel it or not, that promise is still there. And that act of history, that act of sacrifice, that act of love is still there. So Lord, help me to trust it. And, and, and friends, with, your, with heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if, um, if today is a day that you want to start your relationship with Jesus or restart your relationship with Jesus, and you would just like the privilege of, well, you just, just want somebody to acknowledge it and just to see it, I will not put you on the spot. We're not going to make you do anything weird. But if, you just, if what you just want to express in some way today is, I'm, God, I'm coming home. God, I'm coming home. I know you're still here. Um, I would love to have the privilege to just, just discreetly, we'll, we'll do it as a group, but to pray for you. And so if you're, if you're rededicating your life in some way, can we just make eye contact? Just, just look up. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. see you. Lord, thank you that even around the room right now there's people that are, that are connecting with you. Thank you that you're there. That even when we don't see it, you're working. Even when we don't feel it, you're working. Lord, help us. Help me to trust you. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's just interact with the Lord in song a little bit. And so you can stand or you can sit, or whatever's going to be the, the best posture for worship. And I should even point out that if you just want to meet with somebody, there will, there's folks with our prayer team. And if you are one of our prayer team, would you just head back to the prayer station just so that if, if somebody just wants a safe place to talk, that uh, you can be there for them. You are here. Moving in our midst And I worship you I worship you You are here You're working in this place I worship you I worship you Sing that chorus, Waymaker You are Waymaker Work, promise keep your light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keep your light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here, touching. Worship you. 
lights around I worship you I worship you You are here You're mending every heart I worship you Stop one more time. Cause even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Yeah. Please have a seat. So Lord, as we offer a portion of what you have given to us back to you, Lord, we pray that you would be honored by these gifts, by these acts of trust. So whether that gift is happening online, which so many people do, and we're grateful for that, or for the connection card that gets placed in the, in the basket, or the prayer request that gets placed in the basket, or for those who give through the baskets today, God, would you be honored by each giver? We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
And so we make our way to the table of God. And one of many, many reasons why I'm so grateful for the sacraments. I mean, in ordination, they talk about like you're ordained to word and sacrament. These two anchor points that carry our faith. We need the Word of God in our lives so that we can hear the Spirit of God in our lives. It helps us to understand the mind of God better. So we need the Word of God to help our minds to become into greater conformity with God's ways and God's will. And as we make our way through the struggles of life, He's given us baptism to remind us that we belong to Him. And He's given us the table to remind us that whether you feel it or not, you're part of his family. So I think of all the times in history where communion has been shared. Maybe you think of our persecuted brothers and sisters in parts of the world that you and I could not visit today. And yet right now, somewhere in a living room or in a basement, maybe the windows are closed. Maybe it is nothing but candlelight because if this worship service was to be seen, they would be dead. But you know what they're doing? They're gathering around the table because even in the dark, God is still there. Even when you don't feel it, the love of God is present. And one of the ways we know that is the tangible reminder, the living reminder that we have been given in the bread and in the cup. Because friends, on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat, this is my body. It's given for you. That's why every time we eat the bread. We're reminded that Jesus gave his body for you. You might not feel it today. It might be a really crappy day, but that doesn't change what Jesus has done for you. You can't take that away. So in a few moments, we have a chance to receive it. Wherever we are, it's a victory day. That's awesome. If it's a day that feels like defeat, <laughs> you might need it even more. This is Christ's body given for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood, the new promise between God and humanity for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it, remembering me. That's why the Apostle Paul reminds us that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. He is closer than you think. He is right here. I'm going to lead us in a short prayer and then pass over to Pastor Paul. And we're going to have an opportunity to serve communion to one another. To support one another in a really powerful way. Lord, thank you. You gave your body, you shed your blood out of love for us, out of love for me. Nothing can take that away. And so whether today, the experience of today, the experience of this moment, the experience of 2022 feels like a place of light or a place of darkness, God, thank you that you are equally present in both. You gave your body. You shed your blood for us. We remember that, Jesus. Amen. assistance and our prayer team I see our prayer team is there friends today if something's on your heart especially after that sermon today if you just want to talk to somebody have somebody listen go back to our prayer team they'd love to pray with you and always remember what's prayed there has stayed there in a few moments we'll be taking communion the two stations in the back have a gluten-free option and all of our communion cups are filled with grape juice in case either one of those things are beneficial for you. Friends, there are four communion stations around the building. As you go up to the communion station, you can take a wafer, 
The communion assistant will say your name if you have a name tag or if they know you. This is Christ's body given for you. After you've taken the wafer, dip it in the cup, and they again will say, this is Christ's blood shed for you. If one of the prepackaged communions that we've been using for quite a while, you'd rather use those, perfectly fine. They will say those words as well. Friends, the tables are open. Come because you may, never because you must. Friends, please rise as we say the Lord's Prayer. And if you're watching online, I'd encourage you to rise and mouth out the words as well. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a chair real quick. We'll go over a couple quick announcements. First announcement, right after church service, well, we'll give you a couple minutes to grab a cup of coffee and a goodie. We're going to have a membership class. 
If you're a guest today, first time you've ever been here, you're welcome to that class as well. We'll kind of look underneath the hood of the Covenant Church as a denomination, give you some information about Columbia Grove itself, and it's just one of the, the processes that we have for membership. Maybe you've been through a membership class before, you haven't turned in your paperwork, you got a few questions, come on in and sit down. Love to have you in there as well. It'll take about 60 minutes, 90 minutes at, uh, maximum, but just outside those doors, about five feet to the left and go forward in our cafe room. We'd love to see you there in a few minutes. The last Sunday of the month, August 28th, it's been kind of our uh, uh, way we do things here with the North Central Washington Fair. Once again this year, uh, Columbia Grove will be having a church service on the fairgrounds, worshiping on the fairgrounds on Sunday, August 28th, 10 o'clock in the morning. The service will also be simulcast here in the building. So if you don't want to go to Waterville, you can see the service right here on the big screen, and we will do communion and those things here that Sunday as well. Next Sunday, we will have discounted tickets to the fair for next Sunday only. So show up next week, get yourself a discounted ticket, go up to the fair and enjoy the fair. And I think Heather uh, finally got a couple winks of sleep and uh, would like to give you an update on Vacation Bible School. Well, I just wanted to give you guys um, an update as to how everything went. Um, so we had Vacation Bible School Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday this week. And being at my first um, attempt to run this, it felt a little bit like a Mack truck ran over me on Monday. But um, I had an incredible amount of volunteers. And um, I'll try and make it without tearing up because it just was so blessed to be able to be supported by the amount of people that were there daily and that had been praying for us, that asked for anything that we needed help with. It was incredible. But we had, um, Monday we had 18 kids, Tuesday we had 19, Wednesday we had 16. And I actually had two boys that don't go to church here come up to me because they were going to miss Wednesday. And he was really upset and he wanted me to mail him his packet and his snacks. So, Aaron, if you are watching, sir, I have not forgotten. So, um, but they had a great time. We had um, a total of 17 altogether volunteers that helped assist this. So, um, it's amazing. Yeah. We had, um, and if you're here, I would love for you to stand up and be recognized by the congregation if we have time. Do we have time for that? Okay. Oh, sweet. It's like I got control of the radio, right? Yeah. So um, for our teachers, we had Haley Townsend, Alette Ness in the back there, Lauren Nowak, if she, I think she's here. I just thought I, yep, there she is. Um, and her, she also had her mother, Rose, come in, which is, was pretty amazing. We had Lori Northey, who was assisting in class. Cheryl Matier assisted me personally, and I was completely blessed by what she provided. Um, we also had the uh, Minister of Fun, Mark Benedum, and his assistant, Anne. <laughs> they, were, they were in charge of outdoor activities, and I can tell you that this was the most anticipated, other than the snacks, the most anticipated thing of the day. Is it time yet? Can we go outside? And then um, Sarah Floyd and my daughter-in-law, Ashley Mills, uh, took care of Wednesday's activities and we got seriously wet. They had a blast. We had water balloons, all kinds of stuff. Um, I had Miriam Silvernail and Loretta Beck, I know that Loretta is here. They took care of the registration table and snacks. And um, it just completely blessed me by giving their input and, and assisting with making things go smoother every single day. 
Um, I know that I had people with help with snacks, which was to provide, which was Loretta Beck. She brought some snacks. Michelle Torgerson assisted. Barb McCardle. And then um, I also had some much needed technical assistance from Brett Floyd. Thank you, Jesus, that he is here to assist us with what he does. He is amazing. And Andrew Thompson, who helped help me figure out all that stuff back there. So um, it's not my strong suit, and I can tell you that God provides. Whenever you are in your weakness, God provides. He brings you the people, and he brings that to you. So never, never, never be scared to step into anything that you haven't done before, because he will show up in ways that you never anticipate. And so, anyway, I just am so grateful for our volunteers and look for, looking forward to connecting with you um, individually. But anyway. Great job to Heather and all those names that she mentioned. After basically two years of uh, lockdown, uh, there was many days I was the only one here, 18,000 square feet when you're by yourself, you hear every crook and creak and everything in, in this building. And just from a personal standpoint, how incredibly fun it was to listen to all the chatter of little children, just that murmur and the excitement and all of that. It was just absolutely an incredible week. Please rise as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this past week of Vacation Bible School. Hearing these children here with excitement in their voices as they learned about you, whether it be in the classroom, snack time, and playtime, may each of us come to you with that same excitement of a small child. Thank you, as Pastor Andrew's sermon said, for still being here. We love you. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us today, whether you're online or here in the building. We thank you for being here. Remember to love like Jesus. Have an incredible week. Depart in peace. Amen.